Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Professor Kane, for, for joining us today. Um, in your opening statement and in the paper you provided to us and in some of your work, a lot of it's directed towards how we incentivize banks to take less risk or how to reduce the public's exposure to the risks that they take. Um, in the U.S., is there this concept of public interest directors on the boards of banks? Uh, I don't think there's any requirement to have uh, public interest directors on the boards of banks in the U.S. So you're not aware of that existing as a role in any of the banks? No, the, 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 <clears throat> the idea is that the supervisory system is supposed to protect the public. Okay, but And uh, the, the board is constructed, again, for the stockholders. The stockholders vote. And, and, I mean, from your knowledge of banking and, and how the, the board structure works in a bank, I mean, is, it, is it a, as a concept, is it possible to have someone with a, with a dual obligation on the board of a bank to have a responsibility to the, the shareholders and well, also to the public? Sure. The government-sponsored enterprises, Feeney and Freddie, had such public directors. But uh, <laughs> the way in which they are chosen uh, involves a lot of patronage. Okay. Uh, so there was a lot of political influence, uh, potentially, exerted on them. And, and do you know from their positions then, did they have a formal reporting role to the government when they were on those boards, or how did they... Report separately as, as independent directors, or... To, yes, to the government. <clears throat> I don't know if they're adding, that they had any separate uh, obligations. They were just supposed to join the board and represent the public interest rather than being appointed by the top management of the firms. <clears throat> and so was there any, I suppose, public knowledge of how they discharged their duties as public interest directors? Well, I don't think they'd specified that their duties were any different from those of any other director. Um, so that, no, they didn't have th that obligation, although as a public interest uh, trustee, uh, you, you would think uh, <clears throat> that you would feel the conflict if something was being done that was against the public interest. But the danger of, of expressing such conflict in the board. Mention there for a moment, Darren, that this topic, the, the, this House examined the role of public interest directors a number of years ago at the Finance Committee. There is no such thing in Irish law, whatever about US law, as a public interest director. The state can appoint somebody to a bank in the title of a public interest director, but under the laws of the Company Act, that, put, that person as a director owes the fiduciary duties to the institution, not the state. That's right. That's my understanding. And, and uh, it's just the idea that <clears throat> since they are appointed in the same way, they wouldn't feel the obligation to, to the management to keep, to keep them uh, uh, apt to be reappointed. In the U.S., then, was it, was it a government PR exercise, as you would view it? Or a what? How would you view it in the U.S., that, 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 that concept being implied or being, being put in place as a, a kind of a PR exercise on the part of the government there? Well, uh, I was on a, a board of a, a pension fund for 12 years, big pension fund, and I was elected from the beneficiaries uh, as there's a university. Um, it's a, it was a, basically college employees, uh, in short. And for a while, we had this separate track to being on the board. And I could see the difference between the people that the managers had uh, appointed and how they dealt with, so we say, uh, messy situations, and how we, who came out of this other appointment process, dealt with it. But again, all the uh, once we're on the board, we're on the board. There, there was no distinction <clears throat> as a board member, active board member, in uh, my duties. Okay. Thank you. I um, just wanted to look then at, at your work on blanket guarantees. Yes. Um, when you institute a, a blanket guarantee, um, I suppose it implies that all of the covered institutions that come under it are, are too big to fail, hence why you stepped in with the guarantee. And at that point, I suppose, and you're, from your, your, your writing, what you say, uh, it's already too big. And when you have a, a systemic crisis like that, where you have a number of banks, you know, what, what's the alternative there to a blanket guarantee? Well, the, you have to begin with, at some point, <clears throat> you have to clean up the mess. Uh, as I tried to distinguish three elements, the crisis, the restructuring, and the aftermath. And the trouble with blanket guarantees is that they give away uh, a lot of resources at the start and very much constrain what can be done 
in, in the later restructuring and uh, phase and in the aftermath. So uh, I believe that it makes sense to call for a, a banking holiday of a short period of time to sort out which are the really insolvent banks and to take them over temporarily to stop their loss making <laughs> and sell them back to the private sector as they are restructured. So uh, the, the, the trouble with this, uh, these various mercy and helpfulness norms are we let institutions get so far underwater that by the time we step in to restructure them or, or uh, give blanket guarantees, uh, the size of the problem is, is daunting. Uh, and so that it is necessary that we find ways of uncovering these problems earlier. And again, <laughs> by reorienting what auditors would have to do uh, and, and how ta taxpayers would be treated we will lessen the chance that lots of institutions will get into this problem. Uh, when you talk about giving away too many resources too early, you're talking about taxpayer money? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And when you talk about a banking holiday, could you just elaborate on that a bit? Well, of course, holidays is one of these funny words because it's, it's not a celebratory period or anything. Uh, <laughs> but it, it is the idea that you shut the bank for a few days, uh, a troubled institution and send in valuation experts to get an idea, an idea of how deeply insolvent it is. So you, you shut the bank for a few days, and that means there's no access to funds in that bank? That's right. But, but if it's a systemic crisis, then, then no one has access to funds in any of the banks. Well, so. I, well first, I don't think you, you, again, we're talking about what is a systemic crisis. To my mind, a systemic crisis would be starting well before we got to this point where all of them would be having trouble raising funds. Uh, again, it's the ignoring of the expansion of taxpayers' responsibilities until it seems so, these responsibilities are sensed in the market to be so big that we test the system and, and then the regulators uh, feel the problem is too many institutions to, to uh, deal with it in, in a reasonable period of time. But if we tracked better <coughs> what was going on, in particular taxpayer stake, then, uh, and I would also give, uh, this is not in my statement, but it's in some of my work, the, the idea that we could give the, uh, if we'd really established a formal trusteeship at these big, very big institutions that are, are going to be hard to fail, shall we say, um, if we'd really established a trusteeship, we'd give that trusteeship the right to uh, issue treasury stock, this treasury meaning of the corporation, and uh, this would dilute shareholders and change very much uh, the incentives of, of managers and shareholders to tolerate this kind of risk taking. See, this risk taking as it now stands is in the interest of shareholders until things go south. And when things go sour, the smart shareholders should sell. Uh, uh, I, I'm not bragging about this because I didn't sell all of my Bank of America stock. But uh, I did sell uh, a third of it at a price of around 50. And, you know, it went down to three. And, and so, you know, that, so that for me, that too big to fail uh, proposition worked out all right. Didn't work out great, but it worked out all right. <laughs> uh, but uh, on that point, sorry that you're talking about like, tracking better earlier. This is a point about regulation and about, I think you might have referred to in your opening statement about with your an analogy to, to road systems about having helicopter tracking, that kind of thing. I mean, clearly, in your opinion, our, our regulated, regulatory system isn't sophisticated enough. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying yes. Uh, it's not sophisticated enough in that it doesn't understand the value of guarantees and there, or it doesn't it doesn't, uh, what's, uh, not so much it doesn't understand it, it doesn't recognize the value of guarantees. It doesn't make an effort to, get, to track what's going on with this missing element of the balance sheet, the, the value of government support. So for very small institutions, this is not a problem. But as institutions get larger and larger, it be, starts to become a problem. And at some point, it's almost absolute. But in your view, it's not just about the infrastructure, though. It's about a cultural problem and behavioral norms. Well, it, it is. An, I mean, that's a huge part of the problem. But the, the more general problem is recognition that taxpayers have a position. If you take, say, Bank of America that I, I know a lot about, 
Um, bank of America was at one point the biggest bank <laughs> in the United States and made a terrible acquisition of a firm called Countrywide uh, that had been making uh, mortgages that were uh, almost insane. And uh, then it, it, so it added to its position this uh, very troubled firm. And I believe the only thing, way you can justify this is that the Bank of America made itself even harder to fail because it was now even messier for authorities to jump in and try to pull all this apart and bring it back together again. Okay. But, uh, just I miss your question, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, because just in, 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 in the opening statement, you talked about how you've come to understand um, about this idea of how terribly behavioral norms that foster deception and abuse of the public trust are embedded in banks and regulators' organizational cultures. Um, you know, it's a pretty damning picture that you would paint of, of how the banks and regulators view the public, I suppose, or... I, I, yeah, it is. I do think that they have a... Because they aren't forced to recognize that the, the value of the support quarter by quarter the taxpayers are providing, and that it only gets recognized when we have this disastrous situation and suddenly it's recognized all at once and the problem seems too big to do anything about, but as you say, make blanket guarantees. But even blanket guarantees, I mean, to me, anything that's blanket without conditions makes no sense. You have to impose conditions, whatever you do, to say one would be you can't grow anymore. You can't make uh, new loans for a while, or you can't make new loans that are of certain types for a while. That it, it's just the idea of stepping up and saying we guarantee everything just worsens the incentives. Thank you. I just did, the last thing I wanted to look at, because you do make a comment in relation to the banking system here in Ireland, where you say, uh, here in Ireland, banking appears well on its way to becoming a duopoly, with the first mobility to pervert and abuse the rules of your financial roads. Could you elaborate a bit there on, on, on the problem with a small number of banks in a banking system? Well, it, <clears throat> the point is, if, if two banks are very much larger than all the rest, it's very hard for the smaller ones to operate, especially if the uh, giant banks enjoy these too big to fail guarantees. So you will always have some small banks in the system, <clears throat> but they will be disadvantaged because they will not have these guarantees, these implicit guarantees. So, I mean, the problem we had here in the build-up to the crisis was competition from other banks coming in, and what we saw were new lending products and, I suppose, riskier lending strategies. So just to be clear, I mean, are we, are we talking about the number of banks in, in a banking system or the size of the banks? Uh, we're, t we're talking about the banks that have political power to extract guarantees to support themselves. In most cases, <coughs> those are giant banks. And that political power is derived from their size or from something else? Well, it's derived from um, th their ex the exchange of personnel between themselves and government agencies. It's derived from <coughs> campaign contributions that they're able to either make directly or indirectly through, through encouraging their staffs. Uh, it's derived from just basically smoothing people, build, building relationships. So a, maybe an unhealthy closeness between those banks and people yeah. in regulatory or political positions that might have some influence to the crisis? Yes. Uh, yes. That's your experience from the, the, the U.S.? It's my experience in studying the SNL mess, and it just was written even larger uh, in the last crisis, yes. Thank you. And didn't, just, we, we had a commission of investigation here. Thank you, Chair. Led by Professor Nyberg. And one of the recommendations he had in his report was for this idea of, of too big to fail banks, that measures limiting a bank's size and growth could be implemented. For example, an example he gave was setting a limit on the absolute size of a bank's balance sheet. What would you think about a proposal like that? Well, at first it would be hard to enforce because uh, what if you have bank, bank holding companies, uh, if we don't put it on the bank's balance sheet, we can put it on the holding company's balance sheet and they can still exploit connections. Uh, <clears throat> so there would be a lot of trouble writing the law. And in the United States, we have some type of uh, requirements like that at, with respect to the size of the percentage of the banking, uh, the po bank deposits that an individual bank can own. But every time they've approached that limit, a bank has approached that limit, 
they found ways to uh, um, get around it pretty much, maybe sell a few branches here and there, but also just ways of redoing their balance sheets to uh, stay within the limit. So it, it's, <clears throat> it's treating something as a proxy for the problem. Size is a proxy for the problem. It's not the problem. The, the problem is there are these relationships, the, the ability to, to force government support. And, and that means eventually taxpayers will have to pay for it. Another way in which we keep from uh, underlining that is by not, not putting this on the balance sheet of the government <coughs> and until finally the taxes are raised. Okay, just, just to even what Deputy Murphy was also indicating there, maybe you can just put the shape in this before we move on to the next uh, question. Here, Professor Cain, uh, you're a great man to give an analogy or a metaphor or some sort of comparative description on it provides very good imagery uh, to your presentation, but you use the term regulatory capture. What do you actually mean by that? Well, by regulatory capture, and this is not my term, by, uh, I didn't originate the term, let's say, I use it certainly, but <clears throat> it goes back to an article in 1971 uh, by a, a University of Chicago professor, and the, the idea of regulatory capture is, one way or another, being able to dictate the policies, either of enforcement or the rules, uh, to the interests of the industry as opposed to the interest of the ordinary public citizenry. So um, the, uh, it was initiated with respect to price setting for uh, utilities by utility commissions, uh, the notion that the utility companies pretty much dictated what the commission would, would ultimately adopt as prices. But it, it is very evident in uh, uh, U.S. banking. Uh, one of the issues has to do with uh, uh, what is called the revolving door between government and regulation. The top regulators in the United States have, have migrated to one firm uh, in great numbers, promontory uh, group, and uh, they uh, blatantly advertise on their website that they have influence uh, to deliver. And so that's, it's really about influence, about being able to influence or even dictate certain policies. So you, what, what you're naming here is a process whereby the senior public servants and the regulatory financial structures going in to work with major players and maybe too big to fail institutions in the private sector. That's right. And, and uh, then using their contacts. You see, that, I mean, that, you can think of this in two ways. That the, the, re, the revolving door is a very sensible thing to go through uh, as a matter of career management. You can learn things working in both sectors. It'll make you more powerful and which is more effective in whatever sector you stay in. But <clears throat> you may, the issue is whether you try to influence the decisions that are made uh, in, in, uh, in an anti-social way. Thank you, Professor. 